Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. And coming up on today's episode... I knew that we are all one phone call away, one audition away from something really extraordinary happening. Any of you who remember that first, uh, that pilot episode, he, he, as he said, grabs his junk and calls her a pissy little bitch. They liked that sequence so much that they decided to make it the teaser of the show. Now I know that not many, if any of you, will remember the show Dragnet because it originally aired in the 1950s. I mean, I was barely around then. But Dragnet was one of the first big TV cop shows that came on the air just a smidge after TV was invented. Since then, police dramas have pretty much taken up residence on network television schedules. In the 1980s, there was one show that broke the mold, showing the personal side of the people in law enforcement and the judicial system. That show was NYPD Blue. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometko. Join me with today's guest, who played prosecutor Sylvia Costas from NYPD Blue, Sharon Lawrence. Tell me about what made you want to get into what you do so well. Well, as Lady Gaga says, I was born this way. And it's true, I was. My mom and dad met in choir at a small college in the mountains of North Carolina called Mars Hill. They both had great voices. My mom's more of an introvert, um, but a, a true gifted singer and um, a gracious natural beauty. And like I said, she's an introvert. She was an educator by trade. My dad was the extrovert, still is, and he was a newscaster. So, uh, and he did a lot of plays when I was a kid. So I, I, I got the hardware from their genetics, their DNA, the things that their aptitudes, and their their natural gifts, and then the software, meaning the programming for watching him, and them recognizing that this was just kind of how I was wired. I remember, well, my mom taught me how to harmonize. I'd listen to music with her. I was in church choir as a little, little kid. I performed before I even remember it because um, my dad's news station had some children's programming. And um, when Fred Kirby, the cowboy personality, asked if anybody wanted to sing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, I was the first one up and out there because it just came so naturally to me. But I also remember being out in a softball field <laughs> at Collingswood Elementary School, miserable, trying to think, how can I get out of trying to catch a softball? It was just not what I was good you at. You and me both. <laughs> right. So you know what you're wired for, and I'm really lucky I found it early. And that, that public programs that I didn't have to pay for or leave town for were right there. The other thing that really struck me about reading Google or IMDb or whatever I was reading is your list of credits. It's as long as your arm. I've you've been doing been, it for a long time. Yes, but you've. It's one thing to act, uh, perform, entertain. It's another thing to be as successful as you've been. You you don't you're you're what they call a working actor. Yes. A working middle class actor, that's right. Proud of it. Very grateful for it. Very. And I think a lot of it is timing. You know, I I did not do my first role on television until I was thirty. The first time I was ever actually well, I'm gonna go back and say I the first time I was ever on film as the lead was in a training film for my godfather's volunteer fire department in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I played a little girl who set a house on fire. And I do remember it. I, I remember, I was five, I guess, and they asked me to do it because they knew I was an extrovert and would be able to, to do what they asked me. And I remember really being so into it that uh, they, for part of this film, they burned down a, a, an abandoned home so that you, they could film the volunteer fire department doing their work. But they made it dramatic. And the little girl, me, sets a curtain, a, a drape on fire with a big box of matches. And there's a photo of me <laughs> with that match and that box. And I am as evil as you could possibly imagine. And I was a really, 
average kid, you know, there was nothing sinister about me, but I just knew how to embody that. And uh, they put me on a stretcher to uh, drive, do, do the shot where they drove me off in the ambulance to show that she was really at risk, that she had, had actually um, come quite close to her demise. And this was without sound, right? They didn't have sound on this, but I insisted that they run the siren because <laughs> it, it needed to be real for me. And I, I think, once again, that's that's just something that's in me. It's not, it wasn't being a diva, it was about taking it seriously. So uh, I started on stage, that's what felt like home to me, still does in many ways. And I did a student film, maybe my final year in New York, while I was doing, I guess, uh, Fiddler on the Roof with Topol, and I did my, f I did a leading role in a student film, and the difference between that and stage was so interesting to me, and I still find the differences interesting. But I knew I had to learn about it. When I got here, I was actually ready to to play characters that evolved because I did those Broadway shows, playing the same role, telling the same story eight times a week for two years at a time, and I was really ready to do something that allowed a character to shift. Um, and I knew I needed to learn technique, and I'm glad that I did because I was a grown adult, and I knew who I was when I got here, and I think that that's a big advantage. How so? Emotionally, socially. Uh, I was not in the phase of life where I didn't know how to be secure within myself. And this business cannot give you that. No, it can't. It's exactly the opposite. So I knew that I came from a loving family and that that was an advantage. They didn't expect anything of me. I was never pushed to do this. But I was valued for who I was rather than what I did. Um, I had lots of great friendships that were solid because we had seen each other through so many stages of life. And when my life changed because I was lucky enough to be on a hit show, and luck is so much a factor in that, that it didn't change those relationships. Right? Right. No envy comes into it. Mm, no. I knew how to save money. I knew that oh, jobs I wish I'd come, known you. Mm, jobs come and go. I knew that. I had lived that. I knew that we are all one phone call away, one audition away from something really extraordinary happening because I had waited tables many, many, you know, many years. And remember when I got the phone call to do my first, I mean, that felt like one of the biggest breaks ever to uh, get my equity card because I was hired to do children's theater. That was a huge break. That break felt as impactful to me as when NYPD Blue shifted my character from a day player to a recurring player. All those steps uh, landed because I know that the, the, the preparation had met the opportunity. And that felt good. It always felt like um, Grace. How did NYPD Blue come about? The first drama that I did was an episode, first television drama that I did, was an episode of a Stephen Bochco show called Civil Wars. But I'm going to back up a little bit because while I was still in New York and doing Fiddler and having had done Cabaret and Zorba, with a, a, a successful show schedule, which means you're going to run for a long time and you're doing eight shows a week, and you realize the grind behind that, something important happened, and that was that, well, when I left high school for college, I stopped watching television. It just wasn't practical. I was waiting tables at night in college and then doing theater. And then when I moved to New York, same thing, waiting tables at night or doing theater. And I couldn't watch what was on currently. But when I left shows like Dynasty, those, those nighttime soaps were on. And they weren't, I, I never saw myself in those shows. That'll come up again a little later. Uh, but a VCR became something I could afford 
because every it, they became ubiquitous. And I could tape shows. And this was the late 80s, early 90s. And I watched television again after 12 years or 10 years, something like that. And the shows that were on the air were interesting to me. And the female characters were interesting. And those were shows like 30-something, China Beach, and Hill, uh, NYPD, not NYPD Blue, um, L.A. Law. That was a Stephen Bochco show. And I took note of that. I thought, I could do that. That world feels right to me. Those worlds felt like something that I could see myself as an actor helping tell the story for. And uh, when I got to town, I realized what I needed to do. I didn't have an agent, but what I needed to do was understand the casting process. The publications, the, the industry publications like Backstage Magazine talked about casting director workshops. And what that really was was a chance to meet and audition for casting directors. There's controversy around it because it could be considered pay or play, but it was not controversial at the time. And there were really good casting directors that were offering their time to get to know new faces. And I was a fresh face at 30, but a seasoned actor. And one of those that I attended was uh, held by Junie Lowry Johnson, who was casting Bochco shows at the time. Uh, her second in command, a guy named Scott Gankinger, who's still, you know, in the business and a wonderful uh, professional. I read a scene that was a professional woman. And at that point, I knew that that was sort of what I was going to maybe be right for. I played all kinds of people on stage, Greek, German, floozies. Uh, a, a Russian teenager at age 28 in Fiddler. But there was something about my energy that I had been told by, you know, some marketing workshops that young uh, professional woman would make sense. And they called me in for this show called Civil Wars. It was about divorce attorneys. And I played a professional woman. And then, I don't know, months later, I was called in for an episode of a new Bochco show called NYPD Blue. And I, uh, I remember getting the, um, what are called the breakdowns. At that point, we were getting them illicitly. Those of people in my generation will know. Someone in a casting office would send them to one of their friends and we would share them via fax. And I remember and you're going to laugh at me when I say this because I, I, I said so we weren't going to maybe go there because it just feels so over talked about. But on the top of that page said nudity required. And I thought, well, I'm not going to do that because I envisioned it like Baywatch, that kind of character. So I thought, that's not me. I'll never do that. But sure enough, I get called in for the role of an assistant district attorney. And in the script pages, it was clear that it was for written for a man because Sipowitz, uh, who ended up as one of the male leads, of course, I didn't know that at the time. I was only reading the sides, uh, calls the character a pissy little bastard. And I imagine somebody in that Bochco camp recognized that they needed more women populating that world. And I pr probably was a woman that recognized that. So uh, I auditioned with a couple of other women. I got it. I shot it. It was, again, just for a day. We shot a scene in a courtroom and a scene in a, an anteroom uh, hallway where Sipowitz is uh, very frustrated with this, this woman and taking her on and create, you know, not just using an expletive, which was unique at that time in television, but a, a physical move. Any of you who remember that first, uh, that pilot episode, he, he, as he said, grabs his junk and calls her a pissy little um, bitch. They liked that sequence so much that they decided to make it the teaser of the show. And they flew us to New York to uh, recreate what we had already shot in the hallway to now become an uh, 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 interior in the hallway of the famous New York City downtown courthouse 
that became a walk and talk through the revolving doors and out onto the street. And that is how I ended up on NYPD Blue. They recognized that Dennis Franz and I had really good chemistry. Um, they saw me as more playful as a person, and they decided to make this character an unlikely love interest. It was not part of that original Bible, although they had a whole season order, but it was something that was a, a chemistry that they wanted to capture, a, a creativity that they felt inspired to explore, and nobody is, is more grateful than I am. We'll be back in a moment. When I got to LA and working in television was when I felt misogyny, when I recognized misogyny, and when misogyny was pointed out by the network of women leaders. Speaking of television, do you watch television today? I do. Do you have a favorite show? I have so many shows that I admire. And, okay, how can I not forget something? Of course I love Hacks. Uh, of course I, I love Abbott Elementary. I love, uh, I don't do that much fantasy, you know. I'm, I've always been more real people driven. I love, love Succession. I love the British stuff. I love... Um, what was it called? Sex Education. I thought that was terrific. Um, Did you watch The Crown? Yes. Love The Crown. Thank you very much. Love The Crown. I'm just trying to think of what I voted for for the Emmys. That should be easy to remember. But there's just so much. There is. Um, much more than... I love um, Colin in Accounts. The ma or Maid? Yeah. Maid. I loved Shameless. I loved... Oh, just so many... I loved watching Dynasty. I loved being in Dynasty. It, talk about maybe guilty pleasure, maybe, but no, no, no guilt. Just pure joy. I had so many friends on that show, and it was fun doing that physical comedy. They let me do a lot of physical comedy, and I I enjoy it because I'm a dancer. And when I did my sitcom, Fired Up, I got to do a lot of that. Jimmy Burroughs really, really. He he wanted us to go deep with that because that's how we first met was me doing, well, the how we really first played, played, was doing a lot of physical comedy. Do you ever wish that you had um, come along right now rather than 30 years ago? No. Because now, I sometimes, you know, to get where I am, I started in a tiny, teeny, tiny market in northern Wisconsin just to get my foot in the door and, yeah. uh, you know, get a job in television news. I worked in Rhinelander, don't that Wisconsin. Was an, don't you think that was an advantage? Uh, I remember at the time thinking um, Sorry. there were so few choices. You know, you didn't oh. have yeah. all the networks. You didn't have cable. You didn't have satellite. You didn't have streaming. You know, okay, I do see your point. You had ABC, NBC, and CBS, maybe. Right, I see your point. But as I was hearing you, my mind goes to you got to learn and practice this in a true. small market. You got to break through when you were ready for a marketplace that could identify you as ready. Now, I think there's more potential to be part of something that won't perhaps elevate everyone involved. And yet you're still exposed by it because it, it's going to be on the air somewhere. You somehow. know, uh, when I'm asked what they should do by students or anybody who I happen across who wants to know, I tell them, take any job you can get. Just get your foot in the door mm -hmm. and learn. Yeah. Uh, and when I was in Rhinelander, Wisconsin, I started out in sports. Uh, I ended up doing news. One night uh, I was doing sports and news because it was a three-person staff. Yeah. And, and so, you know, <laughs> on weekends we wanted to take, you know, two days off at a time, which was almost impossible. But there was a night when I was doing sports and news and the weather guy got sick. Wow. So I did news, weather, and sports. Wow. And in our spare time, 
we recorded commercials. So there I was in the commercial break saying, if you didn't buy your last car from Sedlac, perhaps you paid too much, you know? And then they'd come back. In other news, it was so bizarre, but I'm, I am in that regard glad I had the experience because I can look mm -hmm. back now and laugh. Um, well, I hope it isn't just laughter. I hope that for you, you can look back and realize that you were adaptable, that you were um, flexible. And I think that's what you must be to survive in this business, to do well. And I hope that people that start, you know, what they do have that I didn't get was the need to learn camera, to learn how to set up lights because they're creating it all themselves. I didn't need to learn that. I, I can do it now. You know, we all had to learn in, in the pandemic, and I appreciate that. I actually enjoy it, but I think that the difference now is you will probably be able to say that you have nine months of knowledge of what your year will be like in a television series because most of them aren't 22 episodes anymore. Some of them are. But you will, you'll have a lot more need to build one job after the other because they just aren't as, uh, there aren't as many episodes ordered. And you will probably have to leave town because fewer things are filmed in Los Angeles. That's harder. When I mentor young people, I tell them to ask themselves very seriously and be really honest with themselves. Can they be gypsy? And by that I mean, can they pick up and move their life? Do they need a nest that is permanent? Are they able to absorb new surroundings, adapt to them, and build their tribe fresh over and over again? Because that's a big part of being a professional. It's not necessarily a big part of being a good actor or a good director or a, a good camera or a good crew person, but it is part of being a happy human if you choose that field. And I think many people don't realize how critical it is until they end up in that environment and then they find it hard to be happy. From what co-star did you learn the most? I learned from Dennis Franz about the true power of transformational acting and the longevity of that and the um, possibility of it. Because if you know Dennis Franz, you know he's nothing like Andy Sipowitz. Nothing. He was in the military, but uh, he, he had none of the foibles. But what he could do is come into the trailer as Dennis and make everyone feel warm and comfortable and happy. He, didn't, he wasn't a method actor. He didn't have to uh, work himself into a lather before he was on set and in between takes. He could be Dennis. And that's an important lesson because it's easy to think that, that the other way of staying in that is, is imperative. And for some people it is, but I saw from him it wasn't. And that's great because I've had to play some people that are so far from me and I, I trust that I can pick, drop it and pick it up. And more than that, the damage that can be done to the other people that you're working with is, uh, you, you need to recognize you are part of, of an ecosystem. It's not all about your process. I learned from Dixie Carter um, how much, she played my mother a couple of times, and um, that graciousness and uh, bringing that, that calm, centered, southern fragrance and grace is a real asset. And I need to remind myself always to do it. You know, she came to set with this just approachable grace. And it, it, was, it was very potent and 
an asset. That's the best word I can think of. Betty White, I learned to always have something keeping your mind occupied while you're waiting. For her, it was the, the a book of jumble or crossword puzzles. Now we have our phones, which is a blessing and a curse. I learned from Alfred Molina um, to constantly go back to to the stage. I just saw him last night with Steven Weber. They were at uh, Musso and Frank's. I happened to be there with my husband and some of our um, out of town friends. And they, they both love the stage. Fred wants to come do the show, by the way. Uh, he said, please tell them I'd love to do it. And Fred's going off to do a play. And I do a play every year. Um, I learned. I used to see Alfred all the time at the Hollywood YMCA. He was a mm -hmm, member there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I learned from uh, Michael Dorman on Joe Pickett. I play his mother-in-law. He is the lead in Joe Pickett. I learned his presence as number one on the call sheet with a shoot that was very difficult because of exterior locations in the beautiful Canadian Rockies and uh, his playing uh, the trauma that his character goes through. How far just a sweet demeanor can go and his true trust that uh, when he says, can I give you a hug? And somebody says yes, that it was a true mode of compassion and sacred, sacred trust. It was refreshing. What would you tell your young self about Hollywood? Younger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I have keep telling myself is it's, it's a long game. And you are your equipment and you will change. And you are the only one who's responsible for that. You must stay healthy and strong. And there will be surprises in your life where you won't feel healthy or strong. But resilience is so imperative. And that comes in many, many forms. And learning self-reliance. Right, right. And, and that means you have to create your own curriculum for staying strong. You have to create your own curriculum for staying fresh and facile as an actor. You have to recognize what every stage of your professional life requires from you. Sometimes it's as simple as stay hydrated. <laughs> and that's not, you know, it's important. And sometimes it's as simple as saying, I can't say yes to this job because I feel like my personal life will need me at this juncture and there will be another opportunity to come along. But now I need to be there for my loved ones. It's as simple as saying what is important now is less about how you look as, as your stamina. How do you develop stamina? What does that mean? It's that I now take a nap at lunch. I don't, you know, go, I'll, I'll get in line, I'll get the food and I'll try to get the right food, and I've, you know, that changes too, and you learn that too. But I don't spend lunch talking. I spend lunch closing my eyes and knowing I have to reset. That's what I mean by long game, yeah. is just knowing how you're changing and being honest about it and knowing that the people that I admire, I, I remember doing a movie with Richard Kiley. You may know who Richard Kiley was. Not everybody will, but he played Man, Man of, La of La Mancha on Broadway. And he was in um, A Year in the Life, a beautiful, beautiful series. Oh, there's another one I'm, I'm forgetting. But he was the patriarch. And uh, he was the patriarch in a movie that I did with Jeff Nordling and um, Kim Hunter, too. They, she played my grandmother and he played my father and watching them come on set and they needed people around them. But once they were there, they were on because they were doing what they knew they could do. But they were conserving up until that point. 
and delivering beautifully. And the wisdom and the quality of their voices were irreplaceable. And that's the kind I, I hope that, you know, I'm 80 and conserving and then delivering something that only Sharon at 80 could possibly produce. I remember Richard Kiley's voice. Mm -hmm. I interviewed yeah. him the night he won the Emmy for A Year in the Life, and talking to him was, mm. he had a real presence. Yes. Uh, just as himself. We'll be back for more in a moment. I have had great women in my life from the get-go, and I was a Girl Scout, and my mom was one of our leaders, and my I just admire my mom's natural ability with children and with a quiet leadership. When I, I didn't really work with many women leaders on Broadway, there just weren't, they were all men. They were, but ne neither did I feel misogyny there. I just didn't feel it because the roles um, on Broadway often were celebrating women, elevating women, if you think about it, certainly musicals. The directors and the writers and all the people that like John Kander and Fred Ebb and Hal Prince and oh gosh um, Ron Field and Jerry um, Broadway director who did West Side Story and Jerome Robbins. Jerome Robbins, thank you. Um, they were either gay men or just very powerful men telling stories that I or always felt gay men. about powerful. Yeah. When I got to L.A. and working in television was when I felt misogyny, when I recognized misogyny, and when misogyny was pointed out by the network of women leaders, an organization called Women in Film, which is still going strong, and I ran, I was the chair of our foundation for years. Um, my first real mentor as a woman was my manager, Joan Heiler, who was the first woman to break the glass ceiling of uh, uh, of as an agent at William Morris. And I woke up to what was the truth about women's leadership and the limitations. And I'm so proud to be part of a generation that has led us to the point where in any television show, there'll be a mandate of at least 50% female directors. That was what we did in the late uh, 70s, all the, the 50, 50 years of women in film's work to get us to this point. It's, I understand the frustration about parity for pay and fewer uh, stories that are, are networks or big corporations that are run by women, but we have made progress and we will continue to make progress because this country's not going, women are not gonna go backwards in our industry. And we have to continue to work, but I, I have faith in the young women that are coming up that they will work toward making that possible. And not insignificantly, part of the reason that women in film after 50 years was able to do what it was able to do is because not every woman was destined to be a mother or had to be a mother because we had contraception. Contraception is really only now maybe 60 years uh, of, of our lifetime for women to be able to control their reproductive fate. And that's why women's leadership and the ability to actually decide their own futures is still so important. And I have no doubt that being a mother is still one of the toughest jobs in the world. And maybe because I didn't do it in my own life, I have um, a, maybe a romanticized view of it. I've played a lot of mothers, and I do play a lot of mothers. And funny enough, one of the reasons that I think I've had a long Gur career, not longer, but had the ability to continue to evolve is I never, ever balked at the idea of playing a mother. And there are points of a woman's career where your career advice may be don't play a mother because once you do, you become pigeonholed or you are no longer considered um, sexually viable or all of those tropes that I didn't buy into, and I've been very satisfied with playing a range of mothers, complicated mothers, loving mothers, and, and the relationships with the characters opposite me, playing those notes, having those experiences of telling those stories have been so satisfying. And the people whom I 
still feel bonded with because we've been, had a parent-child um, dynamic is, you know, irreplaceable. It's been great. Boy, you put a lot of thought into this. Well, 30 years, you know, 30, 30 years of doing, and more than that, four, 45 years of being a pro. Yeah. When your show, the, the big show, NYPD Blue, was canceled, do you remember how it hit you, how it struck you? Well, I was only in the first six seasons of it. And uh, I had gone to do the half hour sitcom. So I was doing both at the time. I was one of, I think, two people that have been on two different networks at the same time. I had good lawyers and good, good studio representatives and, and heads and showrunners, uh, network executives who said, yeah, we can make this work. And it was a real pleasure and a real joy. I left at the same time that David Milch left. So it was still in the glory days. And the day that I shot the scene where Sylvia was shot and didn't make it and said her famous line to Sipowitz, take care of the baby. Um, we shot that in the morning and in the afternoon, I had the table read for another sitcom starring opposite Alfred Molina and with Betty White and Stephen Root and Kaylee Cuoco. And I, I didn't really have a lot of time to mourn leaving that show. I just knew that I was always grateful to be part of something that identified me with such quality. But I also knew that I had so many other colors to play. And it's all interesting how timing and the fates do play into our careers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, my producer has put a question up that he'd like me to ask you. Have you ever told a fib to get a role? Yes, but it wasn't really a role. Um, I was... I had always wanted to learn how to scuba dive. I'd watched um, Jacques Cousteau shows and it just looked so great. And we had a friend when I was growing up, I was a kid, a friend, a really interesting woman who was a scuba diver. So I had that modeled for me. It wasn't just men that did it. Brenda, uh, Brenda Brown was a scuba diver. I had, think I had done a resort dive in Hawaii in the pool and then out 30 feet and I knew, oh, I really like this. And I was approached at a fundraiser for an event that was um, using dolphin to work with um, children that were um, that had autism, and the, the the study of dolphins and the the effect that they had on these kids, which they believe has to do with their the the capacity for both autistic people and dolphins to hear differently. They think it's an aural, A-U-R-A-L component. Uh, they asked if I would be interested in hosting because it was for ABC, which was an NY, where the network NYPD Blue is on. So I was, a, I was part of that family. And they asked if I had it, uh, my license. My, I, I was certified to scuba dive. And I said, yes, <laughs> I wasn't. But I went out and got certified to scuba dive. And I did it pretty quickly. Um, I had a private instructor and I was learning in, in, at the YMCA here and at pools and did my checkout dive. Anybody who's a diver will know what that means. That's your big skill test in February off the coast of um, Malibu. And uh, we had rented a wetsuit for me. You have to have a thick wetsuit for that cold water. And we wore helmets, my, the instructor and I. And the helmet, the hel it's not a helmet, it's a hood. And that hood was too big for me. And we got in to do the dive, and I knew it was cold, but I had, I, I trusted as a dancer. I'd learned my skills. I, I really knew my body. And I got slower and kind of dumber, and my fingers wouldn't work. And we had to do skills underwater and check our gauges. We didn't have computerized um, gauges, uh, and we were supposed to use equipment and add up numbers underwater and my instructor kind of took me by the shoulders and looked me in the eye and went and he unhooked my weight belt I think and no he took my tank off and he got me up slowly 
and we went to the buoy that was our marker and he left the tank there and swam me through the kelp beds and got me onto shore and took um, our windbreakers and lay it down over me and then and this is a guy you know 25 years my senior just a just a solid salt of the earth guy and lay himself on top of me because he was telling me he said you have hypothermia which is a lovely way to die. It is because you just get numb and you're not thinking. Your brain starts to shut down because the blood isn't flowing properly and the, you're, you're being deprived actually of the proper oxygenation of your blood. And uh, that was a fascinating thing to experience because it was so peaceful and he saved me. We got um, a better size hood that had um, titanium woven in. I went out the next day with him and we did another checkout dive on the islands of Anacapa off uh, on a wonderful dive boat that has a hot tub. And <laughs> after every dive, you get in that hot tub. And it's still, that doing that special um, just changed the way I thought about in the environment, which is why I'm on the board of Heal the Bay in Los Angeles now. I'm a staunch environmentalist for ocean conservation because that experience let me see the degradation of the ocean health. So that lie has led to me raising money and awareness for oceans in a way that I feel was completely justified. There you go. <laughs> Um, tell me about this, uh, Kate, Catherine. Yes. The, the play you're doing. Catherine Graham was the publisher of the Washington Post. Right. During the Watergate era and the Pentagon Papers era. That paper was owned by her family. Eugene Meyer, he was a, a wealthy financier. She grew up at the top echelons of privilege in the 1920s and 30s and was a, a young woman in the 40s. And her mother was um, a very beautiful but imperious uh, Episcopalian who was not very involved in the five Myers children's lives. Kate K. Uh, Catherine was um, an introvert, very bright, and she married uh, a, a brilliant man named Philip Graham who was from um, a lower echelon on uh, the social ladder in Florida, but worked his way up through law school and became a clerk at the Supreme Court. And they were head over heels in love. She became one of those famous uh, Washington hostesses because she was very well equipped to run a household to um, understand what it meant to invite just the right people. She was gracious and reserved and had four beautiful children that she loved dearly. And her husband exhibited some extreme and concerning behavior even when they were engaged. Her brother, who was a physician, questioned her about whether or not this was wise uh, because he saw it too. But she was very much in love, and they married. And over the course of their marriage, his bipolar disorder became apparent. And in the 1948, her father gave her husband the paper to run because none of his other children or adult children wanted it. And he was brilliant, and he ran it very well, and that became one of the top newspapers in the world. He took his life in 1963 after having a nervous breakdown at, in public and being treated at a very fine institution. But at that point, lithium and even the electric shock treatment just was not enough. My husband, who is a psychiatrist, has uh, educated me a lot about how difficult bipolar disorder is to treat. It's better now, much better now. Um, because of clinical trials and just advancements in study and understanding of the condition and support. But it was a, a secret that they were living with, and so was the abuse that came along with it. And we're telling the story, we meaning the, the playwright Robin Gerber, who was a Washington insider as um, a lobbyist and a wonderful writer, and she speaks about women's leadership and has written on it, and she wrote a, a biography of Katherine Graham, which tells more than Kay Graham's autobiography, uh, directed by Michelle Joyner, 
And uh, we have played, we won the uh, United Solo Festival in New York, best play, best production, best performance. We've done it in the Berkshires. We did it last spring at the New Jersey Rep, which only does new plays, and then at the Whidbey Island um, Center for the Arts. And uh, we'll be doing it in uh, Milwaukee uh, at the um, Marcus Center in November, and then at Playmakers Rep. And we'll do it here in Los Angeles. It's it's a real challenge. I play her at many ages, uh, from 14 to 75 or 80. I play her mother. I play her husband, Philip. It's, it's again, the transformational a aspect that I spoke about with Dennis. It's been so satisfying because there's none of Sharon in it. Uh, I've worked with a great dialect coach, uh, Joel Goldas, who has helped me sound more like her. I don't look anything like her. I'm not really anything like Kay Graham. But neither have I had trauma in my life. So I can tell the story safely. And I think that that's really important. And we do talkbacks afterwards, and we've raised money for domestic violence organizations when we were doing this as a streaming op option for um, organizations that we could help raise money for. I've learned so much from that community, and I feel very, really privileged to be part of this team that's telling the story and knowing that we are that it's that it is about resilience because three days after her husband took his life, she took over the paper and kept it in the family for the next generation. Not because she was ambitious and desirous of it, but because she knew she was equipped after all the life experiences that she had. When all those men at that boardroom had no faith, she had faith in herself and she was brave, and I admire her so much for that. And we'll be right back. What do you see yourself doing down the road? What haven't you done that you'd like to do? I like inspiring and watching young actors. And I have had the pleasure of substitute teaching, a class here or there, um, offering workshops. I was honored to be a Ten Chimneys Fellow. You may know Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontaine. They were in the 20s and 30s considered the royalty of uh, the theatrical world in America. And uh, they have a beautiful home in Genesee Depot, Wisconsin right. called Ten Chimneys because there are ten chimneys. And one of their best friends was Noel Coward and Helen Hayes and um, Uta Hagen, these were the greats in the American theater in that time. And that home has been preserved as a national historic location. And every summer for the past, I think, 20 years now, actors in the middle of their career are honored by becoming a Ten Chimneys Fellow. A regional theater company, mine, uh, my nomination came from Pasadena Playhouse, where I played Vivian Lee in a production of a show called Orson Shadow. Um, uh, and I mention that because um, I'm so grateful to the Playhouse for their their nominating me and and really doing such great work. They're now a Tony winning theater. So uh, for a week, you attend with ten other actors that are seasoned pros who deserve some mentorship because seldom do you get mentorship when you hit a certain stage of your career or your life. And uh, that year, well, I'll tell you, Lynn Redgrave was, was one of the, the, um, the teachers. Joel Gray, Felicia Rashad, um, who else? Um, Alfred Molina, that was part of the people that convinced him to do it. Uh, Stephen McKinley Harrison's doing it this year uh, again. And um, the list could go on. And would and should. Uh, my year was Alan Alda. And Alan taught us the power of improv. And we did nothing but improv exercises for that week. And it was really invigorating and eye-opening to me how important it is to be able to go back and become flexible that way, not just learning lines, but learning how to merge and become a, a unit 
with your fellow actors improving. So I taught that not that long ago, and it, it really felt great to bring that to young actors, bring that to people that may not even think about being an actor. He taught improv to scientists so that they would be more comfortable presenting their work, getting more buy-in with their work because it moved from being a dry, unattainable lecture to something that was interactive and spoke to people in an energetic way that maybe they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So I think the power in that feels to me like a future I'd like to pursue. I, I, I say that I haven't made a plan for it, but when you ask the question, that kind of live experience feels rewarding to me. Okay. Um, do you have a hero? Yes, my parents. They know why. Because they just are good people who've lived really honorable lives and loved their family and taught me love for where I came from, the love for education, the love for the arts, the love for um, being so grateful for the humble beginnings. My grandparents were the first to go to college and our families and they helped their siblings get a higher education and I believe in that so fully. Um, I have a great respect for wonderful acting teachers like Larry Moss, who I studied with, who taught us the groundwork for real technique. I admire a coach that I am not just a professional um, colleague with, but who's also one of my best friends and was the maid of honor at my wedding, Lee Kilton Smith. I think she's one of the wisest people that I know, and she's evolved and grown and uh, keeps her heart and her mind flexible and open, and I know she will till the day she dies. Um, I admire, I have a, um, a picture of Betty White on my wall that uh, says that you have to be a person with many interests because if you don't, you won't leave, you know, any footprints. And I, I learned about staying interested in so many different things from her, from her. And she was a real influence in my life. Uh, I interviewed Betty a number of times, and I really loved that woman. Mm -hmm. We did an interview with her once. She was just so classy. We did an interview with her once at the zoo here in Los, right. An uh, here right. in Los Angeles mm -hmm. because, you know, she was so in love with the zoo and mm -hmm. did so many things for it. Uh, and we did the interview in one of their trams. And the night before, uh, L.A. had had one of its rare downpours. It rained and rained and rained. And the tram had a canvas top which collected water. Mm. And the first turn we took, it centrifugal force, took it over the side and Betty got drenched. Hair, clothes, everything. <laughs> and, uh, you know, knowing the business the way I did, I said, you know, let's, we'll stop. Let the, she would not hear of it. She was there to do an interview and she continued to do it. And, you know. Yes. And because she's a human, it wasn't about being perfect for Betty. Life wasn't about, it didn't have to be perfect. You had to be, you had to recognize the good. You had to stay sharp. Not Pollyanna, but sharp. And that means acknowledging what's around you. And actually, I could see that really feels like something that makes sense to me is I, when I come across something that that's thrown me off, I feel better about myself having gotten through it than I would if nothing had happened to me ever at all. I had so much more respect for her yeah. after that because you know what? We also went inside to do part of the interview and she asked to have this small creature uh, to hold while she mm -hmm. was doing the interview. And uh, what I didn't know and what she didn't let anybody know until after the interview was over, this little thing had been biting her. <laughs> and she had blood all over her hand. I said, Betty, why didn't you say something? We would have stopped. She was ah, just... She'd work with B. Arthur. That was nothing. <laughs> 
You have a point there. <laughs> um, what was the best thing you've kept from any of the shows you've done? Did you ever? Are you a person who holds on to, you know, little keepsakes, little trinkets? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I have some clothes from shows I've done. I have shoes from my Broadway shows because you don't get to keep the costumes, but you keep the shoes because they make the shoes for you. You dance in those shoes and they are made for your foot. Nobody else can use them. Nobody else should use them. And those shoes show me the path that I've walked. I mean, if that sounds corny, it's true. And the scuff marks on them, I just did a, a fundraiser for the National Breast Cancer Coalition. It wasn't just, it was October, Breast Cancer Month, like it always is. And I wore those shoes. I hadn't had them on in a little while because they're character shoes. And it felt so good knowing that the, the, the strap and the buckle knows exactly where to go. <laughs> and I have put them on. I think those are my shoes when I played Velma in Chicago. And they... They got me through one of the most exciting moments of my life, you know, opening that, my, my opening night on Broadway with that elevator that fam with, to that famous song and Kander and Ebb had been in my professional life since I was in college, really. And I had sung all that jazz you know, before I had any idea what to do with it. And there I was singing it at age 40, coached by Ann Reinking and Walter Bobby. And um, knowing John Kander and Fred Ebb for the years I'd worked with them and realizing that dreams had come true in those shoes. And we're still raising money for breast cancer. And we still have to take care of all of us as women who face health threats and lack of health care and those who, you know who are who benefit from good health care like I do who are lucky to get mammograms every year and now they know to give mammograms earlier and the women I know in my family who lost their life to those illnesses it all was circling through my head when I put on my show shoes. What impact did, did being born and raised in North Carolina have on your life? I'm asking because I, I, I knew and worked with a guy, Jim Lampley, who uh, went to the University of North Carolina, uh, is quite well known as a sportscaster and newscaster, one of the sharpest, brightest men I've ever met. And I used to, I remember when I was younger, I, not to put him any kind of an age gap in here, but uh, I used to envy him and want to emulate him. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, and he was so devoted to North Carolina. I'm not surprised because he came up in that golden age of public education. I shouldn't speak uh, too uh, confidently about what his um, lower grade years were like, but I can speak for myself, and I was part of the public school system in North Carolina uh, in the 60s, which the groundwork had been laid in the 50s, and even earlier because my parents uh, were very much uh, benefactors of public schools, or just the commitment to education in general. And I know, and I've spoken about this, is that because the school systems were great, and they committed to performing arts. I have the life, though certainly the career, and thus the life, that I have now. It was a value system that the state uh, displayed in elementary education with music programs, certainly in middle school grades uh, where orchestras became invested in also in marching bands and high school productions also and then at UNC Chapel Hill the investment in the Playmakers Repertory Company which is a professional theater and that's important because New York actors were brought in and paid the union wage 
and great designers would be part of the experience that those of us that were undergrads had. And they were innovative and they had invested in fantastic facilities, our Paul Green Theater. Uh, I go back and see a play whenever I'm there and whenever I can. It's run by a fantastic woman named um, Vivian Banish who had, Vivian had come through the Yale Drama School program. So you recognize the synergy there between the top programs in the world and the Playmakers Rep and the University of North Carolina's Department of Dramatic Art. We have a MFA program as well as undergrads. And I'll be going back there to do the solo play that I've been doing for the past five years about Katherine Graham um, in January of 2025. So I say all this because I know that those things are at risk. I helped start a theater in North Carolina, a musical theater, with Terrence Mann, who your uh, listeners and viewers may know is the original Rum Tum Tugger, well, the original American Rum Tum Tugger. Um, and then uh, the original Beast and Beauty and the Beast, and um, the original um, Javert in Les Mis. You know, Terry Mann is a musical is musical theater royalty, and he helped create and start a theater that I was part of in the '80s that ran for 40 years. So, it's we take it seriously. And, You're a proud Tar Heel. I, I am, and I hope that that is not going to diminish based on cultural shifts. Sharon, thanks very much. I've uh, enjoyed meeting and talking to you. Thanks for agreeing to do this. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. It was an honor. If you are having thoughts of suicide, there's help. You can talk to a trained counselor at any time of the day or night at the 988 Suicide and Crisis Line by dialing or texting 988 on your mobile phone. Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All Things Technical run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer is Jim Lichtenstein. <laughs>